Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for an opportunity to come uh, together and worship, to learn more about your word. And so God, as we uh, open up this series, uh, War God, we pray that the Christians in this place will learn how to battle the devil. We thank you for this, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Let us all say amen. Let's give God some glory. Thank you, Jesus. So in this series called War, the title of your sermon today is Weapon of Choice. Your lesson is to learn how to win. And then the outcome is to learn to do it God's way. I want you to look at the quote of the morning by Bridget Nicole. It says, don't underestimate me. I know more than I say, think more than I speak, and notice more than you realize. You see, I want you to know that the most powerful weapons around are weapons of humility. And so today we're going to go through a passage and we're going to watch a young man defeat a Philistine with a weapon of humility. Your English definition this morning is win. To be successful or victorious in a contest or conflict. Now, that's the English definition. I want you to see the Greek definition here. It is corde ino. Strong's transliteration 2770. It is acquire, gain arising from escaping from evil, to spare oneself, to gain one to Christ, or to gain, gain Christ's favor or fellowship. I want you to be winners according to the Greek language. Here's your, three, here's your four critical points this morning. Deny worldly tactical solutions. Do not try to do it their way. God has already provided a way for each one of us to be victorious. We must do it his way. The second thing is embrace practical ammunition. Open up your arms to the things that you know work, even though they don't seem like it to other people. And then listen to this. I want you to confuse the enemy with basic training. They will never be able to understand why you're kind to them and they're mean to you. I want you to be able to confuse them. And last but not least, you will see victory over the mighty. Now, I want to take you in to the, um, well, I, why don't I start by saying this? It, through prayer, you've been victorious in many different areas of your life. So what I'm about to teach is nothing new. But I'm praying that today that you take it seriously and don't deviate from using God's methods to win. Do not deviate. What happens with us is we do it God's way for a little while and then when we think it's not working, we decide to do it our way. And there's so many of us that say, well, I tried it God's way, but that didn't work. No, no, no. What didn't work was your way. I want to paint this picture. This is, uh, David's a little boy. Uh, many say he's probably between the ages of 13 and 17. Um, so some theologians say he has to be about 21 years old because he puts on uh, 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 Saul's clothes. Um, th this is probably going to be somewhere around 10 25 BC. The location, they're, they're in Israel looking over the valley of Elah. You, you, the, the situation there, or some would call it the area of Sokol. 
they are, they are uh, northwest on the Philistine side and southeast are the Israelites. And, and this, this, this Philistine is shouting obscenities for 40 days at the Israelite army. There's a little boy down in Bethlehem by the name of David, and his dad sends him up to take food to the grown-ups. When he gets up there, he hears this giant hollering obscenities about our God. David wasn't used to this. He was a young man of courage. He had already defeated a bear and a lion. So what was one more person? When he heard this giant yelling across the valley of Elah about obscenities about his God, he said, hey, aren't y'all going to do something about that? The king came out. The king said, listen, if anybody go over there and defeat this guy, it means so much to me. I'm not only going to give you money, but I'm going to give you one of my daughters to marry. And above all, you're not even going to have to pay taxes. David said, what did he say? You know, they, they, everybody else said, well, you know, he's going to give you money. He's going to give you his daughter. He said, no, what did he say about taxes? David said, I go over there and I put my foot up. Yeah. So this is what we see. So walk with me. I want to go, I'm sorry, to uh, Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17. And I want to go down to the 30. A verse, and that's where I want to start, okay? So listen to this. He says, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. All right? So this is the military under armor. Saul is giving David what he believes is best to fight with. He put on a coat of armor. Now these coats of armor are impenetrable. He puts this on him so, you know, if someone tries to stab you, the, 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 uh, the uh, blade won't be able to go through you. It says, on him and a bronze helmet on his head. Now this is the headgear of warriors. In fact, one of the things, that the, uh, the, the, the armies that actually had the money to buy headgear, most people were afraid of those type of armies. They would give up anyway because it meant they had, they had wealth, they had money, and guess what? It meant they paid their soldiers. So, so here, here um, Saul tries to dress him up. Verse number three, uh, uh, verse number 39 David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. This brings me to my first point of the day. Deny worldly tactical solutions. Do you know that worldly weaponry does not work for Christians? You see, you know, y'all don't know how to do the stuff that they do because you love God. You've changed your life. You're not going to go the full distance anymore. So what happens is you get out there, you start acting like the world, and they recognize immediately that that you're not like us or, or you're not like them. What you have to do is be able to use what God has given you. And don't you know that most Christians lose when they start acting like the world? They bring, the, the, they bring that, 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 those worldly solutions 
into the house of God and they just don't work. Like, what if someone was trying to get you to do something in ministry and it wasn't working out? What if they decided that they were going to use profanity on you? What if they decided that they were going to get physical with you? That kind of stuff you expect out there in the world, but you don't expect that in the house of God. And that's what many of us Christians are doing. We're trying to fight these people on our jobs the same way they fight. And you'll never win. They have far more experience. And plus, you've already been exposed to what to do and not to do. Verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream. Now, wait a minute. He put down the coat of what they used to call, uh, in the King James Version, the coat of mail, the armor. He put down the, the under armor, the tunic. He put down the sword, the only thing that they knew, because steel was, 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 you know, highly developed. And he says, I tell you what, I'm going over to the brook or the stream, and I'm going to pick out some smooth rocks. Why? The smoother the rock, the better the trajectory. It resists wind. There's a study on the type of rocks. In fact, when I was at the Valley of Elah, we all went down into the valley and began to pick up rocks. And, you know, we would bring them back and everybody would say, oh, this is the one that killed Goliath. And, you know, of course, if you study the scripture, the, the rock was supposed to have been in Goliath's head, so none of us have it. But you study these rocks, you look at them, you know, what are they made of? You know, how do these pebbles work? David said, he, David said, I'm going down to the stream. He took his hand, he, he, he chose five smooth rocks from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approach the Philistine. Listen to this. Embrace practical ammunition. You know what that is for us? We have to use the Bible in its fullest to be victorious. God will not let you down. It just, it just seems like forever waiting. Excuse me. It just seems like forever waiting. But just do it his way. You know, I remember there was a time when I, I, every place I went, I had to Fill out, when I fill out the application, it would ask you, me, are you a convicted felon? And I would always put the truth down. And it took me forever to get a job. And I had friends that had gone through the same thing, and when they would go to apply for jobs, they would not put that down. They would, they would say, are you a convicted felon? And they would put down, no. And they would get the job and then 12 weeks later because it takes about 12 weeks for the federal background to come 12 weeks later they would get fired and they would always tell me well at least i earned money for three months you, you at least i earned some money for 12 weeks you should try doing it this way and i would always tell them i was like that's what got me here I, i'm just going to put the truth down and, and I remember going to this place, applying for this job, and the lady, she, she, you know, liked my attitude. She, you know, looked at my, the places that I've worked. She said, you know what, if, if you didn't, if you don't check that box right there, I could probably hire you today. I said, ma'am, one of the reasons that I'm going through this is because I have been dishonest. And I have to be able to tell the truth. Now, I was out of work for two years with grown-up responsibilities, mortgages and everything. But I refused to go against my God. I believe that God's system worked. 
Do you know, amen, do you know that about uh, 12 weeks went by, this lady called me back. She said, Mr. Lewis, I'm calling you about this job. You came in to see me. I said, ma'am, I, yes, I came in. I remember, and I told, she said, your background came back. And I said, yes, and I was very honest with you. I told you the truth. She said, yeah, but I just want to let you know there's nothing on it. <laughs> Amen. They hired me for that job, and it was just an entry-level job. And I went to work like I told you all to do. Go to work early and stay late. And there came an opening. And I was, you know, they said, well, this is open for a supervisor. I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I did, got my resume together, and I went back to the same lady who ran HR. And I said, hey, you know, I want to give this a shot. I don't know how, if I've been here long enough or whatever. The lady said, well, did you see that the supervisor for that supervisor's position is open? I said, yeah, I saw that, but you have to have a master's degree to have that. She said, you know what we could really use in that position? She said, we can use somebody that's honest. She said, and the one thing I know about you is that you're honest. Do you know I got that job and I worked that job all the way up to the day I went into ministry? I want you to understand that fighting God's way works. It's just not easy. David was a guy that said, I'm going to do it the way that I know best. He goes and grabs the ammunition that works for him. We as Christians are not taking full advantage of our biblical text. We're getting involved in our feelings. You're trying to figure out who got the last word. You know, don't send me no long text with a bunch of stuff how you can get the last word. I know you can outsmart me, but you can't outguide me. That's why you're doing all that mess you're doing. You just can't, you just can't stick to it. My wife, sometimes my wife come to me, she's like, hey, what should I do with that right here? This, honey, how should I answer this? I said, pray for him. A person send you that kind of stuff ain't gonna listen to reason. You pray. You get the praying right now. Let's join hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're trying to go somewhere. We want to reach people. We don't have time to fight each other. And then, and then, I'll, and then I'll say, <laughs> under the rule of time management, <laughs> don't answer that. Because you know the person is not fighting to fight properly. God requires us to be kind to people that are not kind to us. When did that change? Yeah, I'm not going to cuss you out because you cuss, cuss at me. And I know some good cuss words, too. I can get down. <laughs> really, I can tell you, I can get down with some cussing. But I'm not going to do it like you do it. You go ahead, oh, John, you this, that, and the other. Oh, you ain't going to do this. Don't make me mad. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just glad I changed enough for you to think that you can get away with it. Why? We got some place to go. We got giants to fight. Look at verse 43. I want to bring you down a little bit. He said to David, and am I a dog? Now, this picture... Uh, this giant, okay? Just picture this giant. He's already seeing David. David is a handsome young man, kind of like us, right, man? You know? You know? So, so he, he's, he's a handsome young man. He's young. The Bible said that the uh, King James Version uses the word ruddy. So we kind of believe he might have red hair or, you know, maybe frecky, freckles or something like that. But still, all in context. And, and Goliath looked at him, and Goliath doesn't see a spear. He doesn't see a coat of mail. He doesn't see uh, all the, 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 the war equipment. So look what he says. He says, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? You know, he's laughing. He's like, oh, ho, ho, ho. Well, what you going to do with that, David? Ha, <laughs> ha. There's a little scene stuff. And what you going to do? And David said this to you about to see what I'm going to do with this. You know, this is what I call, you know what the word meekness, you know what meekness is? Meekness is power.
power under control. It's when you know you can win, but you don't have to prove it to nobody. Amen? It's when you know you're going to win, but you ain't got to say nothing. And they all, you know, they all bad and stuff. You know how they be boosting. Oh, I'm going to do this. Mm, I'm going to do that. And you look at them and say, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. But you don't say anything. So Goliath said, what am I? He said, I, I'm a, I'm a, am I a dog? You come at me with, with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Listen to this. Number three, confuse the enemy with basic training. What am I saying? You must confuse the enemy with simplicity. Believe me, the Bible works. We just have to put it to use. And I can tell you right now, you guys are out there fighting with your fists when you could be doing this thing in your mind. You are supposed to pray for your enemies, and we're not doing it. You know, some of you all say, I'm praying for them, all right. I pray he got hit by a bus. We have to say God's way is definitely going to work. And stand fast. I want to take you to verse 48, okay? Listen to this. It says, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Now, I want you to see something. I want to explain something to you. Um, in the 13th chapter of Numbers, probably around the 28th verse, there is mention of what the 12 spies saw when they went to the land of Canaan. What they saw were descendants of the Nephilim giants. Okay? Now, this requires some study. I won't be able to break this down, and, but maybe at some point we'll do a Bible study and I'll walk you through these giants that entered the earth, that had mated with angels. And so these Nephilim giants were a part or descendants of this Philistine tribe. So when they say that this, this guy, this champion Goliath was over nine feet tall, you better believe it. And, and, and here, it go, here it is, it says, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, look what David did. I want you to see this. He didn't run away. Look what it says. It says, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. See, you don't have to run from these chumps. I know that word ain't in the Bible, chump. But it's the best I could do without cussing. Listen, run towards the enemy with what? Your love? Your kindness? Yeah, it's fine to confront them God's way. See, it said that David ran to meet him. Now, let me tell you what David understood. David understood the timing of the valley. That if he got a head start running down the valley, then he would have the momentum by the time that Goliath came down his side. He understood that he could beat him with his mind. Come on, somebody, praise them, praise them, praise them. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. You're fighting the wrong way. That's why you're losing. You don't, you don't beat your husband. When, when your husband's not talking to you, you don't beat him by saying, I'm not going to talk back. You know how you beat him? You beat him by talking to him. <laughs> That'll make him miserable. It, when your wife get mad, all you go over and do, I remember one time, I remember one time I was in the kitchen, 
and I looked over, I was looking at my wife. I wasn't even, I wasn't bothering nobody. I was looking at my wife. And my daughter came and said, oh, I saw you. I said, saw me what? She said, you checked her out. <laughs> I said, be quiet, kid. <laughs> see, see, that's all you do. Walk up to it for y'all married, this married stuff only. For y'all married stuff, when they get mad at you, Just give him a little pat. Marquita's gonna cut that out for the, uh, <laughs> for the television stuff. I know she'll cut that out. Yeah, then walk up to him. You know, when they get all mad and stuff like this, walk up to him and give him a little pat. Say, so what you doing? What you doing, girl? You know, y'all all, yeah, come on, y'all did. <laughs> you know, and then you, you, you know they're in love with you. So all you got to do is get around this and girl, you can't stay mad at me. Then you know you cannot stay mad. And then do your dance, you know what I mean? Start doing that little dance, you know, like I do the good foot. Right? I was like, come on, girl, you can't, <laughs> they can't stay mad. See, but you try to fight the world's way. She don't say nothing, now there you go walking around the house. You're not saying nothing. That stuff can go on for months. You, it gets so bad, it gets so bad, you got to tell somebody else to tell somebody else to tell her what to do. I'm mad. Listen, that's going to happen if you keep living. There's going to be some times when you're going to be mad. But don't do it God's way. I mean, don't do it your way. Do it God's way. It'll work out. And then I want you to do, understand this. The one thing that we as Christians don't know how to do is we don't know how to use time as a healer. Do you know, sometimes it's not time to talk about this. There's no, the, the healing process hasn't taken place. You know, you, you, you need some steps toward, you know, I... You know, I still got people mad at me for stuff that I did in 1974. Still mad at me. You run into those people, I'm going to get you. I was like, I was 14. You have to be a person of maturity. And that is where we miss in Christianity. There are so many immature saints. Anything can get them messed up. They just come to you and, oh, guess what? Such and such didn't say nothing to me today. I'm like, I guess not. She wasn't at church. <laughs> Y'all stop playing around with me. Verse, verse tw uh, 49. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. I want you to see victory over the mighty. He didn't have a sword. He wasn't very tall. He wasn't, he, he couldn't have weighed no more than 200 on the fat side. He, he didn't have any of these, these modern day technological things that we use to fight with. He had the basic necessities a sling, and a stone. And here this giant lay dead. People, listen to what I'm saying to you. You're fighting the wrong way. You are fighting the wrong way. When you go fill out an application for your job, for your house, for your car. You know the best way to beat the devil? Is to put the truth down. See, because, because if you do it the world's way, chances are you're going to get yourself into trouble. You're gonna, maybe you're successful at getting what you want, but 
you're not successful in having what you need. The thing that you were trying to achieve became the biggest burden in your life. Why? Because you did it dishonestly. You, you, you know, if, if you're not going to work, don't call your boss up and say, you sick? If you're not, do it God's way. Call them and tell them the truth. And you know what that should do? That should tell you whether you should be home or at work or not, right? You can't, you can't call, call them up and say, oh, oh <coughs> um, <coughs> um, is this a supervisor? Right, and then that little voice y'all be doing, it's so tired, you know. Hello, <laughs> this is me. I'm not feeling so <coughs> good. Come on, please. Please. There's nothing wrong with you. Get your behind out of bed and get to work and be thankful that you have a job. Go in early. Surprise them. In fact, they won't even know it's you. When they look up and see you there a half hour early, they're like, whoa, that looked like such and such. And then you know you get off at 4 o'clock. Don't leave at 3.30 just because everybody else leave it. Leave at 4 or 5 and be working. You know, some of y'all, I'm going to let you know something. I see these Facebook posts. Some of y'all work for the government. And I see y'all posting 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. You know, ooh, look what I'm eating. I'm eating this. I'm like, okay, don't post it, eat it. You, you're supposed to be working. Come on, people. You're doing it the world's way, and you're hoping that God will save you. And what I'm trying to tell you to do today is do it God's way, and you will be saved. Look at this your critical points. I want you to deny the worldly tactical solutions. You have to do that. You have to put it out of your mind that profanity is going to be a tool that you use to win with. You have to get rid of the thought that you can lie and be successful. You have to be able to say, I'm going to do good when they decide to do bad and see yourself move to the next position. The other thing is this, embrace practical ammunition. That is the simple things of life. Embrace the ammunition of the Bible. Hold on to the scripture. Don't you know that no weapon formed against you is going to? Do you know that already? But you're not using it. You, you're saying no weapon formed against me is going to be bigger than the one that I go by. And then here we are. I need you to confuse the enemy with your basic training. You know what that is? That, <clears throat> that's don't act like them. Confuse them. In fact, when a person treats you wrong and you treat them nice, excuse me, they scare you because they don't know what you're up to. They remember all that stuff that they did wrong to you. They say, I don't know if I want to ride with him. You say, would you like a ride? They say, all that stuff I did to him, I don't know where he's going to take me. You confuse him with your buddy. He's like, oh, get on in here. Well, listen, I'm sorry about such a thing. Oh, ain't girl, anybody even thought about that. I ain't, ain't, ain't even brought that up in, in 100 years. Confuse him. And then the last thing, see victory over the mighty. Is there any person in this room? that believes that this world is there a person in this room that believes that God will grant victory to those who fight in humility maybe there's a few people in the room that's never given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and they would not know how to do this if you've never given your Jesus Christ, I want to pray with you. 
I'm going to ask you to repeat after me loud enough to hear your own voice. I'm going to ask those that know the Lord to repeat along with me. And if you say these words with your mouth and you mean them in your heart, you will be saved. Bow with me and repeat. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died and was raised for my sin. I believe that Christ Jesus loves me. Please accept me, Lord, as I accept you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that.